We praise in the name of Jesus. We pray in the name of Jesus. And we're going to preach the word in the name of Jesus. Amen. 1 Corinthians chapter number 4. Let's get in there and I'll give you a little bit of a review from last week and keep you up to speed. We are uh, back in our study in 1 Corinthians. Uh, after being away for a little while, we're, we're, uh, we're back in it. And again, it's a beautiful time of worship and praising his name, his holy name. And to be reminded again, there's a shelter like no other, your name, your name. I tell you what, if you uh, trying to figure out some things doctrinally or what you're sitting on or what you're settled into, you, you open up that Bible and read the, uh, the Gospels and the Acts of the Apostles. I know all the other stuff. We're in 1 Corinthians and the letters, and we teach a lot out of the letters and, and different things. But I will tell you that when you think about what those disciples and apostles did in those early years to get the church going, and all they knew was the name of Jesus and they spoke the great gospel, the beautiful, wonderful news of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, the, the good news. And uh, the Holy Spirit of God led them and directed them. And by great power and great grace, they continued no other name to be saved by. Of course, Acts chapter number 4, on and on it goes. So we now are in 1 Corinthians. We are in the place where when you tied to Acts Apostles, the Corinthian church got started in, uh, by accounting in Acts chapter number 18. And you see there that it's around 51, 2-ish A.D. The church is planted and got started. It got started, of course, by the preaching of the gospel. And people came to Jesus Christ. They now then had a new life in Christ. The Holy Spirit of God was in them. They are now the personal temple of the Holy Ghost, the body of Christ is, as the scriptures teach us, with us gathered together, the temple. It's not the building, but we are building. And a picture, this life in Christ together with the Word of God and the Spirit of God. And as we've been learning in the Word of God, what this church at Corinth went through between the space of maybe four or five years we now have this letter that Paul's writing in 56-ish, and, and he's saying, hey, you've lost track of Jesus Christ, but there's no other foundation. That verse was read this morning, for other foundation can no man lay, that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. And so we know that even from last week, being reminded that our foundation is on Jesus Christ, everything is built upon it. This church had to get a handle on that again, so historically... They lost track so quickly. I've mentioned it a few times in our study. How is it that this church was started and it was, it was a, a work, a shining beacon, and, a, and of course a, a difficult city, a city full of Gentiles and Romans, of course, of barbarians, of, of people that, of course, were not of the Lord Jesus Christ. They worshiped false gods and then they came to Christ, so now they have this brand new life in Christ and they have to navigate getting rid of or putting off the old man and putting on the new man. Kind of sounds like when you got saved. And so a lot of things had to be put off and a lot of things had to be put on and that's the spirit of God's working through the word of God in your life. You don't open the word of God. You are now negating. You're actually grieving the Holy Spirit. You're actually quenching the working of the Holy Spirit of God because that's one of his main fulfillments of office is to teach you the word of God, to reprove you, to bring you an acknowledgement of the Lord Jesus Christ, an acknowledgement of God himself. And the one beautiful thing about the office of the Holy Spirit and many things, he, he comes to give glory to the name of Jesus Christ. That's what he does. And so he doesn't want any attention. When we speak of the Holy Spirit, I, I, I think it, maybe he, he just says, don't, don't, don't talk about me much. Just I'm here as the part of the Trinity, and I'm here to give acknowledgement and glory to God and the Lord Jesus Christ and his name. And so as we were in the Word of God last week and, and spending time, we, we covered quite a bit of ground. We, we picked it up around verse number 10. We went down through verse 23, and it took us like two or three hours, but I figured I had to catch up. I hadn't preached in a while, so I had to preach for a longer time. 
So I still got a little bit left over. We should get out of here by 12.30. The, game, the Chiefs played at, uh, I'm just joking, I'm just joking. They don't matter. But we're going to get into chapter 4, and we're going to cover the first few verses. We're going to have the Lord's Supper at the end of service, which is a beautiful thing. But when we cover chapter number 3, and we picked it up in verse number 10 down through 23, we, again, I mentioned it and referenced it just a moment ago, that we talked about what it means to be personally the house, the temple of God, and how God himself inhabits the new creature in Christ. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new, and it's a beautiful thing. And then, from that point on, you're building this new life in Christ. And, of course, he's doing the work as you give him permission. It's a beautiful thing. So we learned last week, as it says up on the screen, the importance of God's people of building on Jesus Christ. We need to build on Jesus Christ. Are we godly builders? I wonder this week, and, and from the message, but even in your walk with the Lord over one year, two years, many years, are you a godly builder? Are you building godly principles in your life? Are you considering that, hey, there's a place for me to learn how to do that? I heard they have this discipleship stuff here. Discipleship goes on in many forms and fashion. There's an older group of people, more mature, we would say. They get together at 9 a.m. over in the fellowship hall in the south corner. There's another group of people that get together. They're young families, and they get together at 9 a.m. In another section of the fellowship hall, there's a divider there, so they're in there. Also at 9 a.m., there's some disciple makers, some disciplers, and we have a thing called discipleship hour, and there's people all ages, but they're in there. And right now, you're studying through the big picture Bible study. Each one of those settings is disciple making. There's discipleship going on. The word of God is being opened. People are living out the word of God by teaching it and by you receiving it. And in the fellowship, there's the temple of God collectively being built and built more and growing. We're his husbandry. We're, we're, we are God's church. We're the bride of Christ. We're the body of Christ. And so we learned a little bit more last week, and Paul's pretty passionate about it. He says, hey, it's an important thing that God's people build the temple on Jesus Christ and no one else. Remember, builders erect things. They edify things. They, 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 they do a, the thing where they found and establish things. Metaphorically speaking, when it says a builder, spiritually speaking, metaphorically, it's to promote growth in Christianity. Promote growth in Christian wisdom and Christian grace to know the virtues and holiness and blessedness of being a believer. 1 Corinthians chapter number 3, you see it there, verse number 11. It was read earlier during our praise and worship. For other foundation can no man lay than it is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Remember, as he said at the end of chapter 3, as we lead into chapter number 4, verse number 21 says, after mentioning again this incredible life in Christ that we have and building on it, he says, therefore, verse 21 in chapter number 3, let no man glory in men, for all things are yours. Whether Paul, Apollo, Cephas, or the world or life or death or things present or things to come, all are yours. But he doesn't stop there. He says, ye are Christ's, and Christ is God's. So in Christ, you are in God, which means you have all these things that are God's. And so ultimately speaking... You're to build the temple on the Lord Jesus Christ and all the things that he says you need will be added to you. It just really supports our studies theme. Love never fails. It's clear that Paul has this incredible love and he's continually communicating the love of Christ. And he's saying, hey, the more I'm loved, less I am. I mean, he is constantly, constantly speaking of love and realizing that this church... If they're going to get it back together the way they ought to get it back together, and we see the second letter to the Corinthians, there's a lot of good things going on. They make a lot of, thing, make a lot of decisions, and they, they do a lot of repenting and turning things around, and you can see that they're getting a handle better on ministry. But it will come back to their love in the Lord and God's love in them. So as we head into chapter number four, let me just ask you a couple little things to kind of Get it going, maybe ask you something, and then make a couple of statements as it previews chapter 4 after reviewing chapter 3. 
Now we look at the importance of God's ministers leading the temple of God properly. So now we're going to look at chapter number four in a way where Paul says, hey, there is some ways in which God proves and God makes the ministers of Christ work and how they are to operate in this church setting. They are to operate in the temple of God, collectively speaking, as the temple of God personally. And so he is saying, hey, I spent the first three chapters really kind of saying, hey, everything's yours, world, life, death, and everything, but you are rich only in Jesus Christ. If all these things belong to Christ, then why should we continually contend or, or have these uh, issues about what's better or worse in the flesh when the bottom line is, you have everything in Christ. Why are you getting your eyes off of things? So, ministers of Christ are important. They need to bring things back sometimes. By leading by the Holy Spirit of God, hey, churches need to have godly ministers. So I ask you, do churches have godly ministers? Now this is just our introduction. We're going to see where the text takes us. But let me just make a few declaratives, a few statements here. Uh, I think you'd agree with me. Uh, they come from Scripture... And Paul stating it over many letters, but I'd say that from experience, this is true. First one, up on the screen. Ministers come in varying degrees of capability and character. Say, well, they're all supposed to have godly character. You're right. They're supposed to be godly men, the ministers of Christ. You as a minister of Christ, in whatever form and fashion, as a leader spiritually in the church... What is your degree of character development? What is your capability list? Talents from God that you give over to him so that he can receive the glory and you work them. And then spirit gifts. What are those gifts that the spirit of God bestows upon you as a gift? We'll come into that as well in 1 Corinthians chapter number 12 and number 14. Ministers come in varying degrees of capability and character. Would you agree? Well, let's try another one. The next one up on the screen. Ministers are constantly judged for their decisions and outcomes. Yes? You're going to find out how to judge properly here. You say, I don't judge me. Well, Paul subjects himself to judgment here. Ministers are constantly judged for their decisions and outcomes. I'm not saying that with any tainted statement or absolutely not. But it's true because ministers are looked at through the eyeballs of man often instead of through heavenly, godly, scriptural principles. So why did you do that? Why didn't you do this? I cannot believe you decided to do that and look at how it turned out. You know all of you are such experts after things are played out. Did you know that? I am as well. I have a master's degree in letting you know what you did wrong after. <laughs> that sounded like Coach's voice back there. Was that Coach? We are of such an incredible ability to do that. So we look at the outcomes, but sometimes on the decisions, why? In the, sometimes we are making a call upon decisions when we have no idea what the minister of Christ knows. And they make a decision based on the Lord or by the situation at hand. And lastly, here's another cool statement I think is right. Ministers are forever, will forever receive both criticism and accolades. Boy, we love, oh, you're so good. Sometimes ministers receive accolades they don't deserve. In fact, most of the time we don't deserve them. God deserves the glory and the praise and the honor. That was a great service you preached the other day, but I wish Bobby was preaching more. Boy, Dwayne, I tell you what, you, when you preach, it's so much better. And, and so we give accolades. Wait a minute, this is God's word. 
this is God's spirit speaking to you. How about giving him the praise and the glory and the honor for whatever it is? I'm so thankful that you preach the message in the way that you do so that da-da-da-da-da. How about that? God just gets the glory. And then the criticism. Well, I would have done it this way. Okay. I got it. Sometimes it's just the way it is. And so we are who we are as ministers. And you are who you are as the body of Christ. And collectively, we are the temple of God and we want him to get glory. So today we're going to focus on the text as it relates to ministers. And their minister of faithfulness to God. How do you look at someone as a steward? A steward, very simply, is someone who... In scripture and theology is a minister of Christ whose duty it is to dispense the provisions of the gospel. We'll get into that here in a minute. What's the definition of a minister? Usually a chief ser a servant. Someone who is an agent appointed to transact or take care of things under the authority of another person. One who executes the commands of another. So a steward is a caretaker of things, but of course it's very close to someone who's a minister. What about a servant? A servant is one who gives himself wholly to another's will. Servants can be servants of sin, the Bible teaches. Because they're operating off of giving themselves wholly to another's will. Flesh. Sin. As much as also, too, a servant can be a bond slave, can be someone who's in a place where they just serve Jesus Christ. How about the servant Moses, who was a servant, the prophets who are servants? Today we're going to focus on the text as it relates to ministers and their measure of faithfulness to God. So, ministers, stewards, servants, okay. But how does God prove his ministers? Over the next few minutes, I want to show you a few things from the scriptures. Let me read this. This comes from Warren Wearsby, a comment about this area and a little bit of an introduction in chapter 4. I think it behooves me just reading it. A lot of pastors will take credit and then go, oh, I, didn't, well, I came up with a... No, I'll give, you, I'll give credit to the people that say it. Wearsby said this in relation to what I'm saying here in our introduction. We must avoid extremes when it comes to evaluating men in their ministries. On the one hand, we can be so indifferent that we accept anybody who comes along. Would you agree? We could do that. We just accept anybody who comes along. But the other extreme is to be so hypercritical that Paul himself would fail the test. That is possible. It is important that we try the spirits. It says that in 1 John. But we must be careful to not grieve the spirit as we do so. Very simply this morning, as we open the text, last week we looked at the temple of God. This week we look at what it is about the ministers of Christ and their measure of faithfulness. How does God prove ministers? You say, I know how he does it. Well, we're going to use the Bible. I think that's a good way. That's why we entitled our message, Tried and True. Tried and True. The meaning of the phrase, tried and true, Definition-wise, dictionary, Webster's, proved to be good, proved good, proved desirable, shown or to be known to be worthy, shown or known to be worthy. It denotes something that has been proven in the past to be effective and reliable. It's an important principle, tried and true. 1 Corinthians chapter number 4, we're going to cover 1 through 13. Here we go. Let's read it. Verse number 1 says, Let a man so account of us as of the ministers of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. Moreover, it is required in stewards that a man be found faithful. Very simply, he says, Let a man so account of us. He's speaking of all the ministers of Christ that are at the church. Because he's not the only one that was there. Cephas, Apollos, he's referring to the ministers of Christ, the church leaders, deacons, bishops, elders. He's referring to them all. And how it is that 
there should be an accounting. We'll get into that a little bit more. Verse 3, follow along. But with me this very small thing that I should be judged of you or of a man's judgment, yea, I judge not mine own self. Isn't that an interesting phrase? I, I find it a small thing that I should be judged of you. Wow, Paul has such maturity. Why does he say that? Well, it's not tritely. Look at verse 4 and 5. For I know nothing myself, yet am I not hereby justified, justified in the Lord only. But he that judges me is the Lord. Whoa, he kicked it up a notch, didn't he here? Verse 5 is good now, watch this. Therefore judge nothing before the time until the Lord come, who both will bring to light the hidden things of darkness and will make manifest the counsels of the heart, and then shall every man have praise of God. Okay, that's the first five verses. Let's continue. Verse number six. And these things, brethren, talking to the brothers and sisters in the Lord and the church, I have in a figure transferred to myself and to Apollos for your sakes, that ye might learn in us not to think of men above that which is written, that no one of you be puffed up for one against the other. This is speaking for itself. This is good text. Just follow along. Inhale it. Just let it come in. For who maketh thee to differ from another? Who does this? And what hath thou that, th that thou didst not receive? What do you have that was not given to you? Now, if thou didst receive it, why dost thou glory if thou hast not received it? How do you glory as if you're the one who played God in your own life and gave you your own self? <laughs> Verse number 9, for I think that God hath set forth us the apostles last. As it were a point, oh excuse me, I skipped verse 8. We got to go back to verse 8. I got you, didn't I? Did you just, you threw something at me because I went like that. I went, wow. Now ye are full, verse 8. Now ye are rich. Ye have reigned as kings without us, and I would to God ye did reign that we also might reign with you. For I think that God has set forth us the apostles last, as it was pointed to death, for we are made a spectacle unto the world, and to angels, and to men. We are fools for Christ's sake, verse number 10. But ye are wise in Christ. We are weak, but ye are strong. Ye are honorable, but ye are despised. Even unto this present hour, we both hunger and thirst and are naked and are buffeted and have no certain dwelling place. Wow, he's acquainted with the Lord Jesus Christ, isn't he? He knows the sufferings of this earth. Verse number 12 and 13. And labor, working with our own hands, being reviled, we bless. Being persecuted, we suffer it. Being defamed, we entreat. We are made as the filth of the world and are the off scourging of all things unto this day. That's some heavy language right there. Let me pray for a moment and then I'm just going to make a few quick points in our lesson today and be done. Father in heaven, this is really some incredible scripture and I thank you for it. In the name of Jesus, I pray that you would just break into each one of our hearts, Father. By the power of the Holy Spirit's teaching, please, uh, Bring us some conviction and reproof. All scripture's given for your reasons. Doctrine, reproof, correction, instruction, and righteousness that the man of God may be perfect. I pray you do a perfecting work in us tonight. I mean this morning. And when we go home this evening, this afternoon, and even into tonight as I'm thinking in my mind right now, that God, it becomes even more serious that we see the importance of being tried and true as believers, but how we see the ministers of Christ tried and true. Teach us your word this morning. We love you. We give you the glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Tried and true. Tried and true. Chapter 4 comes at us, and it brings so much here. It contains the church's responsibility. This is your responsibility, church. Our responsibility together to prove the ministers of Christ. And Paul goes into some some pretty tough language because he says, I want you, church, Corinth, I want you, church, first Bible, I want you, body of Christ, to find the leaders that we're supposed to have in place and then treat them properly. 
Treat them right. Treat them in the way that is Holy Spirit directed by the Word of God. That the Word of God truly has preeminence in how we treat the ministers of Christ. But we must prove them. And they must be tried and true. What do you expect out of the ministers of Christ at your church? What do you expect out of all churches? What do you expect out of leaders that are spiritual leaders that have been anointed and called by God? Well, let's see again what the scriptures say. We'll learn from the word of God. I believe that the first two verses tie together simply. It's pretty simple. We got it from the word. So my first one is this. The minister of Christ will be tried and true in stewardship. I mentioned what it means to be a steward a moment ago. Stewardship. That passage is pretty strong. The ministers of Christ are to be held accountable by the people of the church. And they are also to be the stewards of the mysteries of God. You know where a minister's spiritual wealth comes from? It doesn't come by how many verses he can memorize and repeat to you. It doesn't come by, well, look at what he's done. Look at all the books that are in his room and how many volumes of teaching stuff or how many degrees he has. His spiritual wealth is measured by being a steward of the mysteries of God. The word of God, the mystery of godliness, the mystery of divine indwelling, the mystery of the Jews and, and, and the Gentiles being one body, the mystery of the seven stars and the candlestick. These are all mysteries in the Bible. I believe Brian and you were doing a class of that recently. Is that true, Mike? You had the mysteries. There is mysteries in the Bible, and so the minister of Christ is to be a steward of the mysteries of God. It's required in stewards, it says there, that a man be found faithful. Stewards. To be faithful, to be proven good, desirable, to be proven tried and true, to be the leaders that we're supposed to be. I put a secondary slide up on each one of these. Here's what it says up there. A faithful leader welcomes the accounting of his stewardship. I welcome it, and every minister of Christ here in your church ought to welcome it. Remembering that they work for the Lord first. I am accountable to you, but I'm accountable to the Lord even more so. Every pastor, every minister of Christ, every person in that spiritual leadership is bound to give account to the Lord. But also to his church. You say that's... Uh, opening up the door for us to criticize. I just said, earlier, ministers get criticism, but they also get accolades. They also get a lot of, oh, you did a great job today, thank you. And of course, as every humble minister would do, oh, thank you for acknowledging my wonderfulness. I'm so glad that you finally got on board with my greatness. That's not being a good steward of the mysteries of God right there. That's being a prideful person. Paul explained this beautiful image of a steward. It's very simply someone who manages the master's holdings. What did Joseph do in the Old Testament? What a type of Jesus Christ. One of the faves, one of the best. There's over a hundred different places. Some have different studies. I have a list of 101 or 102 types of Jesus from Joseph's life. He was a steward in Potiphar's house. He was a caretaker. Joseph was the chief steward. The church is, of course, the household of faith. We are ministers of God's incredible riches, his word his mysteries. We are caretakers of that. We are stewards of that. We are to be held accountable for that. Paul said, hey, you've got all this spiritual wealth. You better take care of it really, really, really well. Remember what it says back in 1 Corinthians chapter number 3, verses 4 and 5. Paul said, hey, and we just studied this a number of weeks ago. For a while one saith, I am of Paul, another of Apollos. Are you not carnal? Verse 5 says, 
Who then is Paul and who is Apollos, but ministers by whom ye believe? They're ministers by whom ye believe, even as the Lord gave to every man. Are they not God's men been put in place, and you came to know the Lord Jesus Christ through the preaching and teaching of the Word of God, the gospel, the good news? Are they not, are we not the ministers of the Lord by whom you believe? Yes. Then a faithful leader welcomes the accounting of a stewardship, remembering that they work for the Lord first. This is really, really important because the minister of Christ will be tried and true in his stewardship. Secondly, I see this in verses 3 through 5. The minister of Christ is tried and true in judgment. Now here we come to the judgment part. Let's, let's look at the scripture. We read through it. We paused for a moment, but let's look. Once again, a little bit deeper. Let's go into the four foot, five foot water in the swimming pool. All of you who can't swim, now it's getting tough. Put throw your life preserver. We're going to go a little bit further. It says, but with me it is a very small thing that I should be judge of you or of man's judgment. Yea, I judge not mine own self. He's saying, hey, there's a couple ways of judging. There is man's judgment. There is self-judgment. He says, hey, as a servant, I should judge myself. There's also the judgment of the Lord. Verse number four, for I know nothing by myself, yet am I not hereby justified, but he that judgeth me is the Lord. The minister of Christ is tried and true in judgment. What does judgment mean to you? We need to know what it says here. We've got to make sure that it's not done wrongly. It could be done at the wrong time. It can be done with the wrong standard, not a godly standard, but rather a man standard or a moral standard. It also can be done with the wrong motivation. I'm going to get you. I'm going to get you. I'm going to call you out in the one area in which you are weak, and I'm going to take you down. Okay? Wrong motivation. Wrong timing, wrong time. We, won't, we don't want it to be wrong. We want it to be right. A faithful leader accepts that judging by God's people. He accepts that, the judging by God's people, knowing that God's judgment matters most. But it's still right. You see, we're still accountable. I'm still accountable to you. And it can work beautifully when it's done with the right motive at the right time. With the Lord Jesus Christ being the standard. When it's done right, it can change the whole dynamic in the future of your church. If it is received well, received properly. But the point of the matter is, as it says up there, God's judgment matters most. And when we turned a blind eye or a deaf ear to God's judgment on our, on our lives, it's basically happened because we shut the Bible. We don't want the Word of God to speak to us. When I want to have a free pass, I want to have a little Pasadena in my life, I keep the Bible closed. I don't want to be under any extra scrutiny. Well, stop whining and crying and complaining and criticizing the people. It's not on them. It's on me with God. And as the minister of Christ, I am to receive it properly when it's delivered properly. Now, your responsibility and my responsibility is to look at things and go, judging will come from God's people. Let's see it done properly. Let's see it done right Again, in 1 Corinthians 3, because I believe that the foundation, of course, in Jesus Christ, but the foundation of this statement of what faithful ministers have to be comes from him dealing with where the body of Christ is and where the people are. And he says in verse 12, now if any man build upon this foundation, gold, silver, and he goes through that, hey, whatever your life is, every man's works, verse number 13, they'll be made manifest, the day shall declare it, because it'll be revealed by fire. Verse number 14, if any man's work abide which half he hath built thereupon, he shall receive a reward. If any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved, yet so is by fire. Remember this, it is the Lord's judgment that is most important, that does matter most. 
And daily it can be right there. Daily your works and your life and most of all your heart and your motivation can be judged by the Lord in a beautiful way. Not for condemnation. You're not condemned. The Bible says that there's no longer condemnation when you're a believer in Jesus Christ. Romans chapter number 8. No condemnation. He's not saying you're condemned. He's saying, I want to reprove you. I want to refine you. I want you to be like my son, Jesus Christ, because I know that that life will be a whole lot better than the one where you're being more like you. That's when we get ourselves in trouble. Well, I can be a little bit more of me. The personality God's gave you is awesome. Let Jesus Christ in you make you so attractive that people love being around you. He made you and I individually on purpose. But when he made you in Jesus Christ, he made you a Jesus person with your personality. That's beautiful. He wants to bring himself out in glory. You're hid in Christ. A little highlight for what our Acts 1-8 conference will be like here in a few weeks. Out of Colossians chapter number 3. You're hid in Christ. Third one. The minister of Christ is tried and true in humility. So tried and true in stewardship, tried and true in judgment, tried and true, proven in humility. There's so many examples of just beautiful, godly humility. There is few better than old John the Baptist. As he's referencing Jesus Christ, in John chapter number 3, he comes, the Lamb of God. But he, he's recognizing Jesus and he's letting people know as the preacher of preachers, he's the prophet. And he's saying, look, a man can receive nothing except it be given him from heaven. He's speaking as they're speaking about who Jesus really is. They're, the, John's disciples and the Jews, they're going, what's going on here? They come to John, Rabbi, he that was with thee in, in Jordan, to whom is bear witness, behold, the same baptized. He said, look. I'm nothing and he's nothing except to be coming from heaven. He continues on. He says, ye yourselves bear me witness that I said I am not the Christ, but that I am sent before him. He that hath the bride is the bridegroom, but the friend of the bridegroom, which standeth and heareth of him, rejoiceth greatly because of the bridegroom's voice. This my joy, therefore, is fulfilled. He must increase, but I must decrease. That's pure humility. He's got all these followers. He's got all these people. Think in the church. These men that have all his followers. Oh, it would be nice for someone to be like John the Baptist. And say, if you're truly a man of God, it comes from heaven. If you're truly a minister of Christ, it comes from heaven. And I treat you no better or no worse because of your personality or your character traits or your teaching ability. There's no place for pride in ministry. It's our biggest hiccup. It's my biggest fight. The pride of life can get you so badly. A faithful leader realizes the anointing of his position. He embraces He's embracing the honor bestowed upon him. It's by God's grace. There's no room for pride there, Mark Brown, in anyone else who's a minister of Christ. There's no place. It's an anointing of God given to you by a holy calling. That's why this is up here. Because last year's theme in our Acts 1A conference, and I won't mention it again, but here it is. And it says, by Paul the Apostle speaking to Timothy, hey, guess what? Who hath saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace. You are called as a minister of Christ, not because you thought you were some extra worthy person. He did it by his purpose and his grace. That was 11 months ago. tough to say this. I don't know why it's tougher now. I said it earlier. Eleven months the pastor of the church has been waiting for someone to say, hey, God spoke to me about a holy calling in my life and I can't take it anymore. 
tell me what I need to do in order to fulfill the calling of God in my life, to be a minister of Christ. The life of Christ is totally contrary to the one that this world that you live in teaches. It teaches you to have a human ego. The word ego ties together to I. Let's face it, it says in this article I recently picked up, our culture is brimming with the pride of life. Female beauty is glorified from coast to coast. Physical prowess in sports is given unprecedented acknowledgement. Human ingenuity in science and technology is exalted. Corporate greed is vaunted as shrewd investing. Politicians are praised not for their integrity, but for their pragmatism. It isn't the humble man or woman who is to em be emulated, but the egotist who drives himself to the heights of human success. Unmistakably, we are under the Darwinian curse of the survival of the fittest. That's the way that we are constantly put upon us. We don't need any extra ammunition to live in the pride of our eyes, the pride of our life, the self-willed life. But here's the other side in this article. It says this, pride in the believer. This sentiment remains a great challenge for the most committed believer. When a person first comes to Christ, he must face the fact that he has a long history of seeing life through the lens of pride. He must recognize he must recognize and renounce it. For only then can he begin looking at others through the humble eyes of Jesus Christ. It takes time for the new child of God to think humbly, however. It takes us time, doesn't it? You got time. You got time in Jesus. As he attempts to live by the governing principles of the kingdom, he soon realizes that his old, selfish ways of thinking are still very much alive within him. Yes. We want to have this self-respecting life. But as I mentioned earlier, the respect you get has come from Jesus Christ in you. Your value and worth comes from Jesus Christ in you. And it's a beautiful thing because a faithful leader realizes the anointing of his position. And he braces, embracing the honor bestowed upon him is just simply God's grace. Fourth and fifth ones, here they are. The minister of Christ is tried and true in suffering. 9 and 10, 11, 12, 13, they come very closely together. The minister of Christ is tried and true in suffering. It says really simply here this in verse number 9. For I think, Paul speaking of himself, that God has set forth us the apostles last as it were appointed to death, for we are made a spectacle unto the world and to angels and to men. Now remember in the humility package of verse number 7 and 8, he said, hey, all that you have, how did you declare that it was of you that gave it to you? It's God that gave you what you have. And in this incredible humility, this incredible brokenness, he says, hey, the minister of Christ is tried and true in suffering. Verse number 10, we are fools for Christ's sake, but ye are wise in Christ. We are weak, but ye are strong. Ye are honorable, but we are despised. Paul's suffering is more of an internal thing. The suffering he gets in the heart, the soul, the spirit, and the way he's treated. Oftentimes we look at the suffering of our lives as being physical. This is legitimately... Paul crying out, verse number 9, For I think that God hath set forth us the apostles last as they were appointed to death. What's he relating it to? The church at Corinth is a place where the Grecian Empire, along, of course, with the Roman Empire, what did they do for entertainment? They get in those big arenas, the Colosseums, and they fight. And what do they do at last to really get the people's blood ramped up and the flesh and the carnality of man? They put out at the last the weakest slaves so they can be eaten up. They can be chewed up and killed and the people shout and scream. They bring out the animals. They bring out, of course, the gladiators that can beat them. He's saying... I wonder if it is, very simply put, that in the apostle's life, the minister of Christ, 
that I have been set forth by God, and you as ministers of Christ have been set forth by God last, as it were appointed to death, for we are made a spectacle unto the world and to angels and to men. You've been put on the altar of man to suffer as the ministers of Christ. The minister of Christ is tried and true in suffering. If a minister of Christ is running from the suffering of the work of God, the suffering that is going to be acquainted with them, then they're missing out on what God really has called them to. A faithful leader acquaints with the meaning of his suffering, grasping the truth that it is nothing compared to the Lord's. There's no martyrdom that's sitting around for me or for you or any of us in this time simply because we said, hey, I'm just, you know, better than everybody else and I'll suffer for Jesus. That's not what this is happening here. Out of the humility that Paul is speaking in verses 7 and 8, he says, look in verse number 9 and 10. You know what? There's suffering that comes along with this anointing and this calling. And it's just fine. The grasping of the truth is that that suffering that I go through or you go through, but Paul is saying the suffering that I go through is nothing compared to the Lord's. He finishes with this thought. The last one is up on the screen here is this. The minister of Christ is tried and true in living standard. Look at this living standard that Paul has in verse number 11, 12, and 13. He says, even unto this present hour, <laughs> I'm hungry, thirsty, are naked, are buffeted, and have no certain dwelling place. Labor? Working with our own hands? How about the other side of this empire in Corinth? All the philosophers and knowledge mongers that are so smart, they're above him. And you're putting me down. You are demeaning me because you're smarter than me. And he's saying, hey, my labor is as a tent maker. I am not a learned man sitting behind a desk telling everybody philosophically what they can do, writing papers. I work with my hands, he says in verse 12. Being reviled, we bless you. Whew. Being persecuted, we suffer it and allow it. We don't stop it. Verse 13, being defamed, being completely washed out as though you're nothing, we entreat you. When you defame me, I entreat you. I welcome you into my life. We are made as the filth of the world, he says. And are the off scourging of all things unto this day. Wow. I have a nice shirt on, a nice pair of pants, a nice pair of shoes. Well, I think they are. You may not. I have food. I'm not thirsty. I got a bucket of water there if I need it. I have a nice vehicle to drive to work with, drive to church with. I'm relating to what he's saying. But all over the world there are people like this. And speaking in my mind, I'm thinking very, very simply in the application of this to my own life and heart and soul and to all of us. This present hour, he's saying in this moment, I hunger, thirst, naked, buffeted. I don't play. I have a place to live. I labor with my hands. And it doesn't even matter. We are the off scourging of this world. And it doesn't matter. Because everything is Christ's. And Christ is God's. I am everything in Christ. As far as it's the measure of what the Lord would see in me. It says on the screen, a faithful leader relishes the simplifying of his earthly life. We ought to have a simplified life. It's okay. Because I'm looking into, and we ought to look into the heavenly life one day in the presence of Christ. You see, God proves the ministers of Christ if they're faithful servants, if they're faithful ministers. He tries and makes true in suffering and humility in judgment and stewardship and lastly, of course, in the living standard of that person. Very simply, that person is being looked at as a minister of Christ is saying, naked I came into the world, 
Naked I go out. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Whatever I got is nothing. It means nothing. My living standard is fulfilled in complete wealth by caring for and being a steward of the mysteries of God, the word of God. I finish with this thought as we come to the Lord's Supper. The ministers of Christ are tried and true. They're held to the standard of Jesus as faithful stewards of God's holy calling. This, the ministers of Christ, that God is proving. He's proving them to be faithful. Your Bible teaches you how to do that today. The ministers of Christ are tried and true as faithful stewards of God's holy calling. Okay, so what do I do with that? Here's your question. What does God find when he judges the lives of his shepherds? What does God find when he judges the life of the servants? What does God find when he judges the life of the stewards? We are now stewards as the temple of God for the Lord's Supper. As oft as you do it, do it in remembrance of me. We are here to remember the Lord Jesus Christ and what he's done for us. We are here to examine ourselves before the Lord and let the Lord examine us. What does God find when he checks each one of us out as we are stewards of the beautiful picture of Jesus Christ, death, burial, and resurrection in the Lord's Supper. Please bow your heads for a word of prayer before we go into the Lord's Supper. The music is going to start being playing. The pastors are going to come. And uh, this is your chance and opportunity to really just uh, do some business with the Lord. And it will carry into our time of coming to get the elements and then going back to sit down. Our Father in heaven, this is always a very beautiful, a special time in the body of Christ, in the temple of God. Thank you for your people. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. What love was poured out on the cross for your body, your blood. Thank you for the word of God. Our Holy Father, how it's so powerful and so right and so good. Thank you. Oh, that we have the Holy Spirit to discern, to learn, to grow, to be taught. I pray now as we come into this time, an ordinance of the church, the ordinance of your people together called out in the local ecclesia. This will be a celebration. Break through everything that's in the way. The walls and the scales of pride. So that you receive the glory and honor that's due your name, Jesus. I pray in your name. With every